There you go. OK, um, today I'm talking about modularity and dependency injection at scale. Um, so this is mostly based on the Twitter Android app. Uh, like I, I'll try to elaborate anything that goes into detail about Android, but mostly it's about dependency injection and the things that we've dealt with over the years. So to start off, um, this isn't me. This is like Nacho and Cesar, who's been working on it for the last two years. Um, I'm Saud. I'm a software engineer at Twitter um, working on Android, uh, mostly focused on performance right now. So I work closely with Cesar and Nacho for any architectural changes. OK, so to start off, let's dive in a little bit and like see like what we were doing over the last few years. So Twitter is a really old app. So um, because there isn't that many audience, uh, instead of guessing, let me just show you. This is our first commit. So as you can see, we've been at it for about a decade. Um, this is just the Android app, and we've started before this uh, first initial commit, obviously. So during that time, a lot of the things were different. Um, I believe Android Froyo was out. Everybody was using Eclipse for Android. It was an Ant build platform. Uh, usually, everybody had one module. Uh, so did we. There was a simpler app. It wasn't that many features. Uh, but as we went forward, we extended, we you know, switched to Gradle, we started dividing up the UI and the business logic. And the more we worked on it, the more we realized that it provided more benefits. So we started splitting it up even further. So we split up um, the UI from the features itself, right? Like, so we went feature-wise. Then we even started splitting up what we had under the covers for the business logic to be more generic versus anything that was Twitter-related. We went even further um, and started splitting up each one of the features. So as, we, uh, as new teams onboarded, we were getting more and more engineers working on different features. They wanted to maintain their own module. They didn't want to go forward, right? Then we realized the benefits of that, and we started splitting up all the lower level business logic. <clears throat> I'm going by this fast just to, because it's a brief history, but um, stop me if you guys have questions. Um, we split up even further. We decided to split up our business logic that Twitter related into like subsystems that make sense and like the infrastructure. And essentially we ended up with an app that was a lot of different modules that support each other to build the entire app. At the very top, we had the big module, which uh, was the app itself, and then the features, then the infrastructure subsystems, and finally the core logic. As all of this was happening, we acquired Periscope. And as we welcomed the Periscope team, we wanted to give them what we have learned over the years. And we wanted to build, um, help them build their Android app with the same features that we had. So let's see what happens. So we started off with the Android app, which was this very modularized app at this point of time. And we found that it's actually rather easy at this point, right? Because we could share some of the core logic that wasn't Twitter related. Um, and we can build Periscope on top of that. We actually took it a slightly further, um, and a team started building basically their sandbox. So they can only work on the feature that they want, and they don't have to build the entire app. So this r drastically helped them with build times, right? Like Because uh, you don't have to build every different feature of the app and all of that. And it actually lets you iterate very quickly and like test internally. So I know it, it, this was a lot, but essentially the core information right here is that we split it up into multiple modules that can be individually tested and all of that. And we essentially built all of this on top of dependency injection, right? So the dependency injection that we used um, for this uh, was, was Dagger. Dagger is a very common one. Um, but before we go down that path, let's just quickly go over why dependency injection really helped us on this, right? So it's important. It helped us with reusability a lot, as you saw, like that we can use between Periscope and, uh, and Twitter. It helped us with testability. It helped us with like correctness because we don't have to share like copy code and like could they stick to it. And it also helped us a lot with refactoring. We did a lot of refactoring over the years, right? So it's important to have dependency in injection for us, like, and it's actually important for anybody, no matter the size of the project that you're working on. For us, like I mentioned before, we use Dagger, and like it's one of the common ones that's used in the Android world for any mid-sized to large-sized apps. We started using it, and we learned a few things along the way, right? And um, that's kind of what I want to share today, is like what we learned and how did we handle some of these things. So in general, it helped us a lot with static checks, right? Anything that errors at compile time is way better than seeing it at user level. 
So we want to see something like this more often than like a user complaining to us. And even though this is annoying, it's much better. Um, it helps us with code generation. It takes care of a lot of the boring code that we're doing, right? Like here's a walkthrough. So we can have um, something like this. So ignore the code, it really doesn't matter, but these are modules that depend on each other. So each one of them has their own constructor. And as the constructor changes, we have to update every place that's being used. Instead, if we could use dependence injection, we could have something like this, which essentially just adds this annotation that says, hey, this is the constructor that needs to get injected. And then we, if we change it, we don't have to worry about it. The generated code kind of takes care of it, right? It also gives us a graph architecture, right? Um, so, and this graph architecture allowed us to really scope out and like figure out like how can we um, split up the object graphs themselves, right? Between the features, between all of that. Uh, one thing that I want to note is that every time I talk about object graph, if anybody's familiar with Dagger, we're basically talking about components and subcomponents. Um, there's, there's differences between them, and I wouldn't go into the details of it, but in general, they act similarly. So let's see what we had. Like, so I talked a little bit about the object graph that we built. So in terms of the Android app, so we wanted to start at the very top level and like scope out the different graphs that we have. So the first one that comes, that's the most obvious case is the whole application scope. So this is basically singletons that we have in our app um, that spans across the whole lifetime of the app that, as long as it's live. Following that, we have user scope. So these are essentially, um, you can think of like, like user level databases and like user level logging, like stuff like that. So these are scoped by the user as a user logs in and logs out and, or switches accounts. Like we want to go to the correct one from that. From there, we move forward to like these things that we call retained scopes. So in Android, what happens is that every screen that you see is essentially an activity. And this activity uh, can be destroyed and recreated as configuration of your phone changes. And this could be a simple thing as like rotating your screen, right? Um, so we wanted to have some things that are, as you're seeing the screen, there are things that we need to maintain. So we put that in the retained scope. And then the activities themselves, we actually tied them to the view scope. So this allowed us to have some, some things that can outlive the activities themselves, but at, as long as the screen's on, on view, they were um, provided and like shared under the retained scope. So this basically maps to these four different scopes that we have throughout our app. So we have application, we have user, we have retained, and we have view. Let's dive into it a little bit more, right? So if we see, um, without going full detail, obviously, um, the application scope in Dagger, we would define something like this, right? So we, um, this is in Kotlin, like we define that this inter interface for our object graph, we say this is um, application scope and the module that it relates to that will provide the bindings. And then from there, we basically say that these are the user level objects that we want to build, right? The user graph. In the user graph, we do the same thing. We say this is a user scope. And from there, we say, hey, OK, like from here, we can build anything that's retained scope related, right? So um, from here, like this will be feature level things that we're calling. And then same thing in the retained scope. As we build it out, we have, um, we, we uh, build out the view the view graph underneath the covers, and then like the view graph is the final one that we have for our four different scopes. So these are the four scopes that we had, right? Like the application, retained, and view scope. One thing that you'll notice that we ended up going with component for the top code, for the, the top level scope, and then subcomponents for the under level scope. Um, I mentioned previously there are subtle differences, and like one of the reasons for going down this path was essentially the sub graphs need, needs access to the the top level graphs, right? Like because it, it's everything that the application holds. Even though you're looking at the activity or the view, you might need something that's an application level. So we decided to go with subcomponents. Um, these are things that a lot of the large companies deal with, and they'll build their own set of like um, tooling around it to deal with. We just decided to use it this way. All right. So I've I've dumped a lot of information um, about how we are scoping things and all of that. Um, this wasn't the main part of it. The, the reason I went through it very quickly is because these are things that you have to deal with as you introduce Dagger into your system. Um, you have to decide all of these.
now there are certain things that we ran into and like over time like we decided like we had to like adjust and find things to fix um, or not necessarily fix to basically work around and like get a better at it. So I'll start off with a really easy one, right? So we have a lot of engineers who works on our code base and one of the common problems that we have is how dagger, like how you instantiate the dagger graph. So typically it looks something like this. So in this particular case, you'll, you'll in your application level, you're gonna create the main graph, right? And this particular command um, is actually the generated code. So anybody who's building the application for the very first time runs into this problem where it doesn't know what this class is because you have to first generate the classes and then the um, you can uh, you can reference it in like your application. So we built a very small helper function and we changed it to something like this, right? So in this case, all we're doing, we're just, with the helper function that we have for Dagger, we're just saying, hey, this is the application graph that we're generating. Let's look into it. Let's see what it looks like. So essentially, the helper function has the ability to build this graph, right? And you may be thinking that, hey, like, if you do it this way, it's still fine. You're still gonna end up using it. So we, we used a little bit of reflection. I know it's a, it's a little costly, but we're doing it only once, right? So we decided to just like use the reflection only in this one method, and then the whole graph's presented to us, right? Don't worry about it. This is mostly just checks around reflection and making sure we're doing things right. Um, the TLDR is essentially like we use a little bit of reflection and we get the graph. And once the graph's there, we have access to all the objects in the graph. Um, just a note, like we will post this, so don't worry about pictures. <laughs> it's coming. And uh, shameless plug, follow us on GitHub. Uh, we have a lot of our open source projects right there. Anyway, so we, we basically decided that, you know, instead of using this generated uh, reference, right, like that we have to generate first before we can go forward, as new people are onboarding to not have them deal with it, we just, you know, created this little helper. So this was a very easy one, and like it really didn't make much of a difference, right? Um, what else? So this, is, this was a big problem for us. So we have, we, we've decided on all these graphs and we want to really figure out where should we place them. So we started off with like this thought. We're like, okay, we have this modularized app and we have these scopes that we have defined and what makes sense? And we said, okay, well, you know, it makes sense for the user and application scopes to be at the very low level possible because these are not really tied to anything and everybody should have access to it. Um, because you, 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 from the top, you have access to any module that's below you, right? Like you don't have the other way around. Um, and similarly for, because the retain graphs and the, uh, the retain scope and the view scope is related to the activities, it made more sense to be in the feature modules. Let's see how it works. Uh, does it hold up, right? So let's take an example of tweeting, right? We're gonna tweet out this with an image and you know, and like, let's walk through what all's involved. So essentially, to start off, our feature is the composer. The composer is the one that's gonna take and let you compose this tweet so that you can post it. So in a very basic sense, without diving into a lot of crazy things that's going on, we can say that, hey, at, at the very least, it has an activity, uh, which is the screen. It has a view model, which defines the logic on the UI logic that we have over there. And the delegate is something that we, we do which basically um, links to the activity. So instead of using the activity directly, we use this view delegate so that we can unit test that without requiring any of the Android specifics. So it makes sense that, hey, these are the feature level components, so it goes to a feature module. Um, what next? So then we would need the tweet repository because we're basically generating a tweet and we want to put it in the repository. It makes sense that the tweet repository is a user scope, right? Like, so as long as the user's logged in in any of the activities, you'll get access to it. So the, this is a subsystem that gets added here and we run into our first problem, which is we wanted the user scope to be at the bottom so that everybody have access to it. But um, the thing is, if you define it that far down, you, you can't define the objects at the top, right? Like, so, all right, well, let's move on. Let's see what else we run into, right? So the user scope needs to be at least in the sub subsystems level. 
Um, next, we have the image, right? Like, so we, we are adding an image to this tweet, so there's an image uploader. Now, this is just a Twitter infrastructure thing, right? Like, so it's not really tied to the user. This is like something that gets kicked off. So it's an application scope thing that runs as the image is being uploaded. So now, it's not really a generic subsystem. So once again, we're in this case where we wanted it to be at the very bottom, but the application scope kind of needs to be a little bit up. So one thing that we're noticing is that the application scope needs like to be at the very top, right? Even though like this is something generic that we can have with OKHTTP, OK which goes at the bottom, but the Twitter media image uploader um, module that we had is like one level up from that. So let's get even more crazy, right? So uh, if you tweet out in Android, you'll notice that while the tweet's being posted, there's like a notification that shows up, right? So this notification handler is essentially tied to the application. Like it's, it's not really related to the activity. It's not really happening on the activity. It's, it's just on the app and it's contained there. So we want to, but we want to put it with the features because it's related to the composer. Um, so if we add it there, what we also ended up doing at that point is like we just move the application scope and the user scope at the very top. Because it seems like there's like at any different level, like we can have these scopes, even though we were really originally wanting to do it at the bottom. Okay, so you know, um, so one thing over here, like you know, like all the the pentagons right here that I have are just the different bindings that we were we were having, and then like the circles are like the scopes that I've defined. So you know, these are the modules that we we talked about. So we'll add them right there, right? Like so. So at least that makes sense. Like whatever modules we created for the dagger bindings, they can stay with the features that, that we want, right? So we kind of had to shuffle around a little bit of the ideal location, but you know, we, we can try to deal with it as we go forward. Let's see what else we can do. One of the things that um, we want to look into at this point is like, how, does, how do these graphs then access like from intermediate modules, right? Like so, even though originally we said that we wanted uh, one, the application scope and the user scope at the bottom um, and the retain scope and the view scope like further up at the features level. But then like, you know, now that the application scope and the graphs are defined at the top, which makes sense, but we, ha we run into this case. So imagine this like legacy activity that uploads image. I don't know what it does, but let's just assume that it's one of those. Now, it needs to access the application object, right, graph that's defined at the top to basically get access to this image uploader. And that was one of the reasons where we, where we originally was saying that, hey, it makes sense to have the application scope defined, the application graph defined at the very bottom, but we were running into this case. So let's see how we can walk around it. Because the module is going to be right there with the feature, like as we were talking about. So we wrote this another helper. We, we love helper classes, by the way. So we wrote this helper class that essentially could be the provider for the application graph. And then we said that instead of doing this where we were storing the application graph um, at, in the application level in like a member variable, we, we instead, we changed this to basically be um, assigning it to the provider. So instead of storing it in the application itself, we provide, we just store it in the provider and the provider knows how to then get access to the graph. The magic part of it is like, then we can move the provider all the way to the bottom. Like there's no reason for the provider to be at the top, even though the graphs get defined at the very top, the provider can sit at the very bottom of the, of the, of the, uh, the modules, right? So, in this particular case, then, like going back to what we had, where the legacy application needs access to this media subgraph, if if we have the provider, then we can just do something like this, right? Like so, the provider will give you the graph. We know that we are looking at the media subgraph, so we can just cast it and access the image uploader. Let's clean it up a little bit, right? We can just move it into with a helper method, right? And the helper method can just cast it and just give you this, uh, give you the subgraph. Um, we can actually clean it up a little bit more. Like, so you don't even have to think about the provider. We can just do it in the graph itself. In the graph definition, we can write a companion get getter that essentially does the same thing for you. Like it will access the provider and like cast it. And then 
the use of it in the legacy module ends up being something very simple. You know you want to access the media graph. You can just get it and access whatever you need from that graph. So this simplicity essentially takes care of this case where we were reaching up and down at this, to basically get down to the lower levels. Now we can just reach down. Like, so we can just go to the media subgraph and the media subgraph can reach out to the provider as needed. What else did we have? So one thing that you might have noticed from that um, example is that the graphs can grow. Like we were just talking about composer. So if we look at just the composer, we had at least like the, the compose launcher, the, the notification handler, and then like, you know, with the tweet repositories, whatever related to that, and it can keep on growing. And that's just like one feature with like a few things added, right? Like, and, and then we, if we add all the other ones, it grows, it becomes big. So we, we thought around and figure out, okay, how can we deal with it? And one of the thoughts that came about is that we can introduce subgraphs. So with subgraphs, we can clean it up and we can actually define it. So we were already saying that there's the media subgraph, but like what if the definitions completely could be used like this way, right? So just using a very short version of the application graph, so we had uh, composer and all of these, we can we can just split it up, right? So we can say, hey, the composer related, it goes to the composer subgraph, and we can just basically extend the interface as we need. So we can do that for the other ones. We can do it for the tweet repository, the images, and like whatever granularity that makes sense, right? And we can build all these subgraphs and make this very simple object graph definition where you don't have to worry about what all bindings are there, right? Like they're all defined in their own subgraphs. And then, like, like we were saying before, where the media component me modules were right there, right? But now we can actually move the subgraphs to that level, right? And we can actually put them right where they're defined. So wherever the bindings are, we can put the graphs right next to it. Kind of like helps us get rid of this very big graph and distribute it to, with all the features that we have. All right. Question comes up immediately from that is what about testing, right? Um, we have all these subgraphs. The subgraphs knows how to pull things on their own. And the subgraphs is looking at the provider directly. So how do I actually take advantage of the testability of dependent in injection and like replace it? So what we did was we added this little thing for the provider. So the provider, we added a map where it can basically store some of these overrides that you have and an ability to override it. And then in the getter, we essentially look at it and see if there was any overrides. If there is any overrides, we'll return you that, or we can just return you the real implementation that was already there. So then, like, you know, that's taken care of. Now, we, as we started using this more and more, we ran into this problem of decoupling features. So, the, so I want to dive through it a little bit more and give you a little more detail, uh, because this was a doozy. Um, so, let me use the example of the app navigation. So essentially, if we have a very simple Twitter app, imagine it has only four modules. Imagine it only has the main activity, it has the ability to show tweet details, um, it can do a compose, and it have DM for direct messaging, right? Now, you can get a tweet link via a DM, and if you tap on it, you want to be able to open it. So now in Android, how activities work is that you, for to launch that screen, you need the activity to create an intent around it, and then you basically launch that intent. So for, for in this particular case, the DM activity will have to know about the tweet detail activity so that it can launch the intent related to that. And then you can go from DM to tweet activity. However, there's a feature where you can share a tweet through DMs, right? So then the tweet detail activity also has to know about the DM activity. So this means that we have this circular dependency and you know, that obviously doesn't work. So we, th we thought about it and we basically ended up introducing a subsystem called navigation. And the na the, so this is how the navigation subsystem essentially works. So we created these intent factories essentially for each one of the features, right? We, we call them activity args. Um, they are related to the features directly. And then we moved these activity args into the navigation subsystem. So that way, like every activity as you need to do, all you need to have access to is to the navigation subsystem and you kind of like take care of this circular dependency. Let's dive into a little bit on like what the activity args look like. So I mentioned before that they are basically intent factories. So essentially the interface looks something simple like this. 
Um, and from there, what we want to do is essentially just generate the intent that's required to launch the activity. One of the immediate bonuses that we got out of it is we actually had type safety of the arguments because they're just like bundles that's defined in Android. Um, so that was a big bonus, but like it's kind of like something that we just got out of it. Now, it, as I mentioned, it creates the intent activity, right? And then for all of these different ones, so now we have these activities and all these like intent factories spread all around. Um, we wanted an easy way to collect them all together. So we built the service discovery. The service discovery, what it does is essentially uses the multi-bindings feature for Dagger and pulls in all of these intent factories that we have defined. Let's dive into a little bit. So even smaller example here, but essentially like we have these intent factories defined, right? And we want to basically have them in the object graph somewhere so that we can easily reference to it. So we use multi-bindings from Dagger, which will just essentially collect all of these definitions because they're defined and then put it in. For us, it, Dagger can put it in as a set or a map. We've decided to use a map. And essentially what we said is that for each one of these activity arguments, like map it, the values, the activity arguments, and the key is the, the activity class. So then we have access to the activity class and we can generate the intent. Let's dive into like what we did. So taking composer module as an example. So we added uh, this tag uh, into map, which comes from Dagger, which basically says that pull this binding into a map. And then we said use uh, activity arguments as a key. And then the value would be the activity class itself. This essentially generates this map, right, that we store in the, another helper function um, called activity starter. So this is in the navigation subsystem. So this map is then later accessed. So when we want to create something, we have this map and we have this helper method now that can kick off the activity. So all you need to know is that this is the activity argument that's required. Now Android requires context for a lot of these things. So we take in context for this case. Um, but then all it does essentially is that it generates the intent like we said. Right, and not, nothing more to it. Essentially, um, getting rid of the circular dependency that we had, and now we essentially have this module, like thanks to Dagger, we have this map, and we can actually relate the different intent factories to the activities themselves. All right, so we learned a lot about Dagger, using Dagger over the times and over the years, and as more and more engineers were onboarding and more and more features that we were writing, we started seeing some of these even like start streaming. So I want to go into even more um, details that we ran into. So we used it for initializers, like it's the same features, like with the service discovery, we used it for all the initializers. We used it for like notification handlers and we also use them for deep link handlers. Like that way we just spread it out wherever they're related, right? And like this particular thing, like we basically ended up building this thing right that's on top of uh, Dagger so that we can like help um, distribute the graph like into the modules themselves, right? So the subgraphs, however, ran into a problem. So we found out that the subgraphs themselves are not atomic. So w let, me, let me explain. Um, so we have this graph definition that I mentioned, right? So there's a top level graph and then the, all the subgraphs defined in the modules that they have. But then to use Dagger, we essentially have to actually define a module next to everything, which defines where the bindings are. So you, to build a graph at the very top level, you have to point it to the modules and then you also have to point it to the subgraphs because of the definition that we have. And then it gets worse because we share code with Periscope and we would like to keep on doing it. When you have a new definition on, that's a shared module, you essentially have to define both of them in both the apps. And this will just keep on growing, right? Like now we have sandboxes that everybody's using. So everywhere, you have to remember to do both of them. So what can we do? So to start off, like, so using this broadcast example, um, so that's the subgraph definition which says this is the binding that we're having, and then the dagger definition which actually provides the binding. So we started by basically annotating that, hey, this is our subgraph, so we know what a subgraph is. And then we're saying that, hey, this is the scope for the subgraph. And from there, we said, hey, we can actually say that, hey, this is what's tied to the subgraph, right? Like, this is the module that you need for the subgraph. And then, from the, the big graph at the very top, instead of saying that, hey, this is this like component with all these modules, 
we can essentially say that, hey, um, this part can be replaced with that this is an object graph. That's all, like that's all we need to know, right? We can do the same thing for the user level stuff um, because it's a subcomponent, but essentially that's also an object graph that's defining everything. So the big difference between the subgraphs, like we said before, was just a pieces of the object graph. The object graph is like the full definition. So this annotations then, like we basically send it through the annotation processor that we wrote and it can crunch um, and generate the dagger compatible components and subcomponents. So we define the subgraphs and like just let it generate whatever is dagger related. This is like fully dagger compatible, right? Um, because we are definitely using dagger under the covers. It's just like like simplifying the, the one of the things we ran into. What else? Um, let's see. So subgraphs are not encapsulated right now, right? Um, let me let me explain that. Uh, with this example, right? So what, what I mean is that when you have all these different subgraphs, like you, you actually don't know how they relate to each other. You, you don't know who needs what. It's only when you add it to the object graph that you realize that, oh, I have everything that I need, right? Uh, what we would like is that at a, subgraph, at a subgraph level, we know that it actually has all the bindings that it requires. So what we did is that, you know, we took this definition of the modules and like, of, oh, sorry, of the subgraph, and we added the dependencies. So we know that this subgraph has other subgraph de dependencies. And then, you know, instead of having this issue when at compile time at the very top level in the graph, we say, hey, there's a binding missing, we can actually get the error at a very lower level. So we know that this particular subsystem is actually missing a binding. And then fixing that will just fix the entire graph, right? And the bonus from that is that now subgraphs are fully documented, right? Like we have, from this definition alone, we have what, what are the modules that's related to the subgraph. We know what are the dependencies of the subgraphs and we also know what bindings that's being provided. So looking at a subgraph, you know what all it needs. What else we ran into? So we ran into the case that subgraphs are not reusable. Um, and you're gonna say, Sao, I thought that's the whole process of doing it, that's why you're doing it. But like, there's a little bit that what I mean is a little bit nuanced. So we can use this network subgraph, right, for example, in any app that we want. But then when Periscope came along, they said, hey, you know, this doesn't work for us. Um, we need to use a special cache. And since it's defined in the subgraph, there's no way for us to reuse it without copying the whole thing. So we, we thought about it and we were like, this is a big fail. Um, what if we think about it in terms of just what we would do with a class, right? So if, you, if we were a class, we would say that, hey, you, this is not a final class, it's an open class, so you can extend it. And then we could say that, hey, the cache is also an open function and you can overwrite it. Then for Periscope, you can actually like override that binding even just by extending this and just overriding the special cache, right? Like just saying that it hey, replace the cache with this special cache. And then um, something like, that. so it would have worked. And so we basically added annotations that basically references the same idea, right? So we're saying that this particular subgraph is open, which means that you can extend it. And then we're saying that this particular bindings are open, which means you can replace it. We didn't do it for all, we, we left the power so that in some cases, as you're building the module, you know that you cannot replace it. So you don't want to do that for everything, right? You want to limit it. So we built it in, instead of um, having everything be overwritten, we, we allowed it to be defined, right? And then like, when the Periscope comes in, it can define its special cache and like, say that, hey, this is a subgraph, this is the override. Um, so we can reuse the override annotation and say that it binds to the cache, right? Final thing that we ran into is that subgraphs don't support inversion of dependencies. So this, is, this was very tricky. Um, as we started doing more and more things into the subgraph, we ran into this case where we wanted to define this database subgraph. And the database subgraph in general, like you know, we, we have this definition of the schema of like what this database holds. But a database subgraph is more like an abstract thought, right? Like we have multiple databases and each database will have its own schema and we want to invert this dependency so that we can provide the schema for different um, databases but also have like the modules themselves, like anything that uses databases take advantage of this subgraph. So just like before, um, 
just like open before, we, we added abstract annotations. So the abstract annotation says that you cannot instantiate this graph. You can extend it. You can build something like this for Twitter, for example, like we, and, and you, it, if it completes all the bindings, then it's a complete graph, right? And it, it's not going to be an abstract. And then you can invert it and you can say that this is the schema that the Twitter database requires and everything else is provided from the database graph. And so that was all the subgraph stuff. And finally for the graphs, we ran into this big one, is that they are hard to maintain. So just like Dagger, where you have to define all the modules at the top, now you have to define all the subgraphs. So something like this happens. Um, even though we are putting all the bindings in their own little graphs, you still have to define the graphs. And it gets really insane when you have a lot of features. Um, if you haven't seen it, trust us, we've run into this. And so what we decided is like, all of this information is available to us. So can we build an annotation processor that can crunch it, right? And then essentially does automatic discovery and essentially all you have to do is say, hey, this is, there's this object graph. It can find the subgraphs that's required and pull it in. So essentially, you know, at runtime, uh, at, at, when you're writing code, you don't have the types available, so you don't really know. But at compile time, these are all there because of the automatic discovery, right? And we did more from there, right? So once we solved that, we added support for um, factories, like in general, like just first class support. We add, it improved our build times a lot um, because of the distribution of the graphs. And we are working on an IDE integration right now. This annotation processor that we created, we call it Scythe. And you know, it has all these features that I've been talking about for the past 30 or so minutes. Um, and we are planning to open source it this year. Okay, well, thank you very much.